Rightio, and one, here two, we go. Three, four. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, welcome to the Matty Johns podcast, and today is a very special one. It's the life of Craig Johnston, and uh, for me personally, this is not just my favourite Australian sporting story. It's my favourite sporting story worldwide, full stop. And today we're going to talk about uh, the way that Craig Johnston willed himself from being the third or fourth best player in his junior soccer team at Lake Macquarie right through to uh, scoring goals in FA Cups, winning European Cups and league titles with the legendary Liverpool Football Club. And then we're going to talk about retirement. His invention, which changed sport and football right through to the challenges. And I've got to say, as a kid, this is great for me today because as a kid, reading Craig's book, Walk Alone, uh, written by Neil Jemison, the assistant uh, editor of Playboy Magazine Australia, he, um, it actually it, it changed my life forever. I finished it and uh, I turned it over and I started reading it again. And, and it just it shows you what happens when you truly dedicate yourself to your dream. I've got no doubt you'll enjoy listening to this today. Jono, firstly, welcome, mate. Thank you for coming down. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks, Great mate. to see you again. Jono, you, you, you um, like a lot of us, you fall, in, you, gener- you fall in love with the game that your dad played and your dad was a footballer. He played, uh, he played soccer with Cardiff. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. What sort of player was your old man? Probably the same as me. Tenacious. Uh, tenacious, enthusiastic. Uh, and uh, loved it, you know, and, and he was like that with everything, Dad. He was a good tennis player um, as well. Loved his rugby, loved his horse racing. He, uh, he was just the, mm. the old-fashioned Aussie bloke that loved it all. Couldn't drink enough beer. Uh, he used to hang out with Reggie Date, uh, who's a legend of the game and a legend up there in, in yep. Newcastle and sort of controlled the, the – uh, he was like the mafia of the pubs. So back then they, they had their own, uh, uh, if you like, enforcement policies. What do they call oh, them now? Oh, yeah, yeah, the bouncers. Bouncers, yeah. Yeah, yeah right. So their own enforcement back then. Reggie yeah. Date was kind of, you know, running a lot of that. So uh, so Dad Dad loved Reggie and idolised him. And to this day, my father never, ever called me Craig. He always, always Reggie. Always Reggie or Reginald. Yeah, right. If I'd done something right, well done, Reginald, never well, Craig. And you know what? I loved it. I loved it. John, I, I, was, I, I told you the other day, I was taught by a fellow called Malcolm McLennan, who taught me in year nine at, at Mate Maris Brothers, and he played junior soccer with you in Lake Macquarie. And he told me that um, you were about the third or fourth best player in the team. He's probably being generous. Uh, so how does, how does someone... Um, you know, who used to be nearly the best player in his junior soccer team, decide that's what I'm going to do. That's where I'm going to be. Well, I mean, what is your gift? Is your greatest gift your determination? Uh, I, I'd say no. Um, uh, I, I think a lot of people are determined. You and your brother were. Uh, Peter Sterling is. Wally Lewis were, were all uh, determined. Uh, Timmy Cahill. Mm. Um, but... I was a very good student. My mum was a high school teacher, uh, sorry, primary school teacher uh, and a headmistress for a while at, at Burrigal Primary. So I was good at science and maths and therefore I analysed what I was doing much more um, sort of uh, interestingly than other players who, who had a gift, a guy called Peter Tredenick, Malcolm McClellan, Brett Cowburn. Mm. Uh, th- these players were all better than me because they had a gift of God to play football, and some players are naturally gifted, as we know. Some players have to work at it, but but I figured out that the, the, the ball is a perfect object and it doesn't make mistakes, and the person using it makes the mistakes, and the more you use it, the less mistakes you make. So um, I used to say to Dad, I'm coming to work with you. He worked at the council at Spears Point, mm. uh, and uh, so he would wake me up about 6 o'clock when, when the sun was rising, and he'd take me, he'd drop me off at uh, Burrigal High School and I would get a tennis ball and I would play against the wall. Mm. Bang, bang, left foot, right foot, you know, volley, you know, um, two bounce, one bounce, you know, no bounce, volley. And basically that uh, before the kids got there. So if dad's dropped me off at 6.30 mm. and school starts at 9, I'm getting two and a half practice before the other kids come in. So my eye's in and we had this famous wall ball game uh, and all the Tredenic boys... Uh, here you go, Michael Bogart. Mm. There's another name for you. Yeah, you know, yeah. they yep. were all there at Burrigal in this culture, but they would get there a half hour before school. 
So I must have loved it three times more than them. Uh, yeah, right. And I was saying, hey, I'm getting better at this kicking the tennis ball thing. So when you got on to training at Lake Macquarie, now where Spears Point uh, Park is, the northern New South Wales, that's where we, we, we used to train, Trinitic Oval, a soccer ball seemed like this enormous big thing that was much easier to... So it was basic science and love and care and figuring out my problem. And my problem was I couldn't play like the other, other, other players. What did your mum and dad sacrifice for you, to give you the ability to at least pursue the, this crazy dream, Jono? Well, this is why I don't like to tell the story. Um, so forgive me if I get emotional, but but everything, you know, they um, they gave up everything. And dad, you know, worked his, his butt off at the council and he worked weekends, uh, you know, for football boots and all the normal stuff that, that um, dads do, you know, soccer dads do and soccer mums do and uh, same with mum. But... Um, they knew that I I wanted something badly, um, and they knew Mum had been very clever, and she'd said, "Well, I said, Mum, I want to go to England. I want to be a soccer player because I fell in love. I saw it on the television, a black and white television, uh, when I was in hospital, when I when I was younger, um, and um, uh, they sold their house to finance my trip." and moved to a, a smaller house uh, and they did everything they could to uh, to get me to England to this trial. And uh, clearly when I got there, uh, I thought I was, I was, I was all right, you know, uh, by Australian standards, but I was so embarrassingly poor that, and, and the, the trial, my first day, um, I'd left uh, in, in December Australia. So the, the weekend before, I was at Nobby's Beach with with my mates and and the girlfriends and laughing and joking as you do as a, as a 15 year old. Mm. Two days later, I'm in the cold north of England, Middlesbrough, you know, which is nearly up near Scotland, mm. in the snow and the rain, and the and the. I know this is not a kid show. The, mm. the shit in the mud mm. that you're playing in, and we're getting beat three nil at half time, and the manager never comes to trialist games. But Charlton came in with, with a bright red face and a big neck, you know, a giant man. Yeah. You know, and he had a go at everybody. He said, you're rubbish, useless, hopeless, crap, shit. He said, and you, where are you from? Um, he screamed at me. I said, uh, I'm from Newcastle, northern New South Wales, Australia. Right. And he said, well, you are the worst footballer I have ever seen in my life now. Big swear words. Mm. And I said, what now? Half time. And he said, yeah, now. Go. Said it again, swear words. So uh, everybody was like horrified, uh, especially me. So I packed my bags up. I don't know anyone, right? And I've got raster hair, but I, I got surfer's hair. Yeah. You know, the ringlets, so the ringlets. With, the, with the blonde. And it's full of mud and shit and snow. And all my face is covered in dirt. And I'm packing my bags up, you know, and, and I've gone outside, closed the door into the snow and, and what have you, burst into tears again. And I didn't know where the digs was. So I had to find my way to Ayrson Park, then ask them where the, the digs were, where the trialers stay. I finally got there two hours later in the snow, right? And um, I had to phone home and uh, tell my mum and dad that they'd basically wasted all their money. And uh, uh, you might remember reverse charges where you have to phone overseas and then they wait for you and they verify that you're not yep. going to cheat. And then mum has to say, we'll yep. accept the call. Anyway, it took about an hour and a half, whatever. And um, mum came on the phone. She said, Craigus, Craigus, are you safe? I said, yeah, I'm safe. I've, I've made it to Middle... Colin, he made it to Middlesbrough. Uh, she, she said, well, what are you doing? I said, I had a trial. And Jack Charlton was there. Colin, come to the phone. Jack Jesus. Charlton was there. So dad comes over. Reggie, Reggie, you made it, son. You made it. What did he say? And I said... Daddy said, I'm one of the finest players he's ever seen in his life and he wants me to stay. And I hung the phone up and burst into tears again. Um, and uh, that's the story. And uh, that's why I think kids want to hear the story and parents want their kids to hear the story and, uh, um, because it's anti-sport story. Tell, tell me about, tell me about the, those car park sessions. Well, well, what, what happened was that the timing was an issue because Charlton had said, uh, out of here. So some of the older players, and there was one in particular called Graeme Souness, had heard about the roasting. Graeme Souness. And another one called Terry Cooper. 
who was left full back for England, lo- lovely people apart from anything, they said, OK, a bit harsh, but, but you're in a harsh environment. If you clean our boots and our cars in the car park every day, we'll pay you some money and you can live in the, in, in the coal shed out the back of the digs so Charlton doesn't know you're there until you've got enough money to so, go home. So you weren't allowed to stay in the digs? So you, no. wanted, so, you, so you had to clean boots, clean cars and yeah. live in a coal shed to just stay there? Well, it was an old coal, coal shed. Yeah. Now, now it had electricity and it, 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 uh, it was secure and, and, and it had a heater, the old-fashioned heater. But it was the old coal shed next to the digs because Charlton had said go, so I wasn't allowed to stay. But they heard about me. So this was also being a good kid. They recognised that, that I wasn't an, uh, uh, as weird as I looked, yeah. that I was a good boy and that I could be of service, which was all, all the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. So they paid me. So, so it was quite, quite happy. So I would get down to Ayrson Park, hmm. you know, half past five in the morning uh, before anyone got there and I'd practice, practice, clean the boots. Right When they came and they went to training, I'd come in and I'd wash the cars in the car park. Then I'd bugger off and then they'd come back home and they'd leave and they always left me some money. You know, five are here. And they're hiding you from Big Jack. From Big Jack, yeah. Yeah, so that happened uh, for about a year and a half. Um, and then when they went in the afternoon, I would then come back after all my jobs to the car park, which which was, let's say, four times bigger than this room, mm. but made of brick. So there was plenty of walls to draw targets on and start bouncing the ball off. No touch, one bounce, volley left foot, volley right foot, and creating these these skill games like all sportsmen always did. Mm. And I used to lean on the old... Um, uh, uh, Don Bradman story with the yeah with the yeah with the golf ball and the cricket stump cricket stump and the corrugated iron yeah. there was a one call Emil Zadipek who was a famous Czechoslovakian yeah. runner who would fill up gum boots with mud and he'd train with mud in his gum boots so when match day uh, sorry race day came he'd take the boots off and Way he felt go. like he was on the clouds so I, I put lead in my boots. Right, so my feet would get quicker um, because I was on the drag. So I, I invented all these ways to actually create, ultimately, a mistake to attempt ratio. Um, and you touched on this. So I had one thing in life to do because I was running out of time and, and money, right, um, was to be a better player at night than I woke up in the morning. Mate, no, no iPhones, black and white television. Right, um, not that I watch television. Uh, no internet, no Molly, Molly coddling, no parents, no friends, no nothing. No complication, and you know what? Mm. Loved it. It was the best period of my life in a certain way. I was in jail. I, I was in jail with one thing in the world to do is to figure out, as I said, that perfect object, what part of foot on what part of ball, to what effect. And I listen now to the experts like Malcolm Gladwell and they say 10,000 hours. Mm. My theory back then, pre-Malcolm Gladwell, was 10,000 touches Mm. a day. What part of foot on what part of the ball, to what effect? And you know what, Matty, when, when you're working on control, pass, dribble, shoot, and you've got goals, then, then my first uh, m- metric was I'd spend six hours there. Mm. And then I set myself tasks. Six and if hours I, in the car park. In the car park. You know. But then I set my task and it was hurting me and, and, and I was sore and I was, I was exhausted of a night and, you know, and, and, and I was getting homesick and, uh, and lonely, all of that stuff. But then when I set these tasks, it would be out of ten. And if I got to nine volleys hit the target and I missed, I'd start again. So I had to focus and my metric became I could get home in five hours if I hit all my targets. Mm. Then four and a half hours, then four hours. So I'm saying, hang on a sec, you're, you're actually hitting the target with your left foot, your right foot and the little square I draw myself in chalk and paint, mm. you're controlling the ball tighter. So wow. I was actually getting better on a daily basis. Confidence builds, self-esteem. Touch, touch. Yeah. The craft that, yeah. that, that the other players had because they'd spent years doing it, the craft was coming. How long did, how long did it take till you actually started to get some serious traction from that on the training field with the other apprentices? Well, I, I wasn't allowed uh, because, you know, my nickname was the kangaroo in the car park. Uh, <laughs> And some part of me says that Charlton knew, uh, knew I was there, but everybody had said, look, this guy's 
trying his, his backside off, leave him alone. Um, Charlton then got transferred to, uh, he took a job at Sheffield Wednesday. And a new guy came in called Jack, uh, John Neal, mm. right? And he got out of his car and I'm, I'm you know, s- scrubbing the cars and still got the raster hair. So John Neal's come in and he said to the players, he said, Who's, who's, that, that, who's who, that bloke? Who's that bloke with all the hair in the Trying car park? Trying to steal park? the cars. Yeah, <laughs> the cars, yeah, yeah. And they said, oh, that's the kangaroo in the car park. And he said, well, is he any good? And they said, no, he's crap. He's crap. And he said, well, how long has he been there? Well, you know, about a year and a half, whatever. And they said, oh, okay. So he came out uh, and, he, and he stood there and he watched me. And he watched the... The targets and the goal that I'd drawn with chalk and, and here's dribble, here's volley, here's pass. And he's going, this is very clever. He said, he said one thing to me, I always remember it. He said, put it in the bank, son. Put it in the bank. And then he lay with the Welshman. Put it in the bank. That's all he said. And I thought, what does that mean? Put it in the bank, you know. Uh, so I guess it's an old-fashioned I- expression. So long story short. Um, about another three or four months, there was a middle winter, it was a dreadful virus that was going around the club, so they couldn't play a reserve team game. Oh, by the way, you asked me about playing. Mm. Uh, I wasn't allowed to play while Charlton was there, clearly, yeah. with anybody. Um, but on the way home from Ayrson Park, the cobblestone streets by the, the gas lamps, right, that the little kids used to gather. Right, full-on cobblestone, you know, the, the full old, you know, uh, chocolate box picture. Mm. And these kids were there with their accents and what have you. So I would stop and I asked them if I could play. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm older than them. I got the big hair. I look like Rude Hullet or, uh, you, you know, Bob Marley, actually, yep. you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, and they said, yeah. So I played with those kids. But, wow. but, 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 you know, they're like... Eight, nine, ten years old, up, up, up to fifteen. So but they're all things, better than me. They all, yeah, right. They would, they would run rings around me, and they'd nutmeg me, and they'd take, take the, the, the piss out of my accent, mm. and they'd call me Skippy and Kangaroo, and uh, you know, uh, or, or you know, whatever, you, whatever was the racist term <laughs> of the day for Australians. <laughs> yeah, those, right. Those kids called it to me and more. Yeah. But I loved it because they let me play with them. Yeah, right. Let me play with them. When did the big break happen? Oh, okay. It was all well, this that's training. That's what I was getting. Yeah. So I was doing all this training. I, I, I would religiously now go and uh, play, play with the kids when, when they let me, um, which was great. And then this virus swept the club and there was a reserve team game and they couldn't fill the slots, so they were going to forfeit the game, right? And then John Neal said, well, well, if you need one more player, what about the kangaroo in the car park? So they said, well, he's, he's crap, he's no good. And, and, and he said, but, but he doesn't have to play, just put him on the team sheet. So they said, oh, okay, good idea, and we won't have to forfeit the game. So now my name, Rue, Rue. short for kangaroo in the car park, went on the bottom of the she- team sheet. So anyway, um, for months I'd been practising chip the crossbar, which we all played as youngsters, five balls on the arc of the D, one on each corner, one in the middle, split the difference, so you got five balls. How many out of five do you hit the crossbar? Mistake to attempt ratio. Yep. I'd been practising that. I'd been in the corner with the volleys, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, and then the dead ball free kick on the 18-yard line, bang, in the five targets. So they're getting beat 2-0 at half time. Two people got injured, two so players. This is the first team? No, no, it's the first sorry, team. Sorry. Yep. Juniors, this okay. was a reserve team game. Yep. So anyway, getting beat 2-0. I came on, scored a chip, a volley. And dead ball. We won 3-2. <laughs> no, Not so no, crap after no, all. No, 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 no. And they've all gone, oh, my wow. God. Yeah. And there was a, a, a very famous guy called um, Harold Shepherdson, who was the, the assistant um, to Don Reavy when he'd run, mm. won the World Cup uh, for England. And Shep, Shep was the, the money guy at the club. And uh, he'd kind of helped me with this, that and the other previously. And he came to me that afternoon. He said, we're going to give you a contract. Wow, do you know? Uh, so I got a contract that afternoon. Uh, £14, 14 pound a week I was on. Everything starts to change. You, now you've got traction. Yeah. First team to Burr. Well, very, very similar. Um, so I played for the, the, the youth team, the reserves, for a long time. And very similar. A virus had, had taken a, a lot of the players down. Uh, and John Neal, uh, who'd always sort of liked my attitude, yeah. if nothing else, yeah. um, um, put me in the team. And, um, and 
I played really well uh, against Everton in the FA Cup. Yep. Uh, and, uh, y- y- you know, it-, it was funny, but um, I said this the other day and uh, it always, again, it gets emotional, but... Uh, you know, uh, somebody asked me what it was like when you realised you were now a, a professional player. And um, I said, remember in your little kid, I don't know about Cessnock, but in, in Newcastle they had parades and floats? Yeah. In Sydney, did, parades yeah. and floats? Yep. And people would go past and you were a little kid and you'd wave up to the float and they'd wave back to you yep. like this. Yep. Right. Well, I'd always remembered that, and I was now standing on the field in the FA Cup against Everton with a Middlesbrough shirt on, 17 and a half years old, youngest player ever to play for Middlesbrough. I'm there on the, th- on the thing, and it felt like I was on the float. Now people were waving at me, and I was Somebody. like, hang on, well, whatever, the, the, yeah. the man on the float, you know, and, and it was the weirdest thing, and I waved back, and I'm thinking, it's me, I'm, I'm on the float. I'm on the float. Amazing, Struton, John Neal. There's so many similarities between you, Mikey, and his respect he had for you and how, what he saw in you. And my brother, Andrew, he, when he trialled for the Newcastle Knights for their under-15 side, he had a growing disease in his leg, which was undiagnosed, Oscar Slatters. And um, he had them both legs, John Neal. And he turned up to trial for the Knights this day. I remember watching him as his older brother, and it was, it was so embarrassing because mm. it was so bad he couldn't he couldn't get out of a, a shuffle and the crowd were laughing and everything like that and mm. the coach David Waite said mm. I'm going to sign that kid mm. if he's got the guts to go out there and play with that there's something special about him mm. Mm. first team yeah. Yeah. Jono yeah um, how did you go how how'd you go in that FA Cup against Everton. I, no, I played incredibly well. Played, played incredibly well. Uh, and don't forget, you know, as, as a 15-year-old, this is only two, two, and two years and three or four months since the roasting. Uh, since um, you know, when I was playing for Lake Macquarie, again, you, you talk about Andy and his deficiencies. Mm. I wasn't good enough to get in the Lake Macquarie um, rep team. And Dad said, yes, yes, he is. My reg is good enough. So he took me out of it and he took me to Newcastle and I played for Lambton. You're right. Yeah. And I got in the rep team. So there was politics back then yeah. like there is now in, yeah. in the selection. So, so da- Dad was good enough to figure out the, out the politics. The um, reason I was telling you is back to, 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 to Jack. Um, Jack Charlton wasn't wrong. But John Neal saw what, what uh, uh, your other friend there saw in your brother Andy. Yeah, David White. Yeah, yeah what he saw yeah. in Joey. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, he saw something uh, and, and he backed it. John, when did Liverpool, well, not, not, not just Liverpool, because Nottingham Forest, there was a number of clubs after you. Yeah, 10, 10. 10 clubs. Mm-hmm. When, did they, uh, when did they start to tap you? At the end of one season, um, when I'd had a really, really good season. And um, I forgot to tell you, you know, my really good debut um, mm. for yeah. Middlesbrough. Headlines in the newspapers next day, especially the Sun newspaper. Jack Charlton. I always knew the kangaroo would make it. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Did he really? Yes, he did. Oh, he did. big Jack. That's what he said. Oh, dear. And, and I pulled, it, <laughs> pulled, it, pulled him up years later. He was doing a, a, some sort of coaching or, or some sort of a presentation at... Um, the casino up in uh, Gold Coast, yep. Jupiter's. So they invited me up to be on the same bill, and I, I gave him some stick. <laughs> that is good. But but I, I knew his son subsequently, John, who was a croupier up there, and he's a good lad, a good player. Yep. And uh, Jack wasn't wrong. Mm. Bullying was what you did back then. So he there was no political correctness, mm. and everybody had f- come from all over the world to be a player at Middlesbrough. So there was no time for all of that. Yep. You know, thank goodness times have changed now. Mm. But um, yeah, so so that headline was was well, classic. unbelievable. Yeah, I've still got it. I've got just got it. The other the other lovely story um, about that uh, that game, you know, when it was over and we we beat Everton, um, I think it was the fourth round, and um, yeah, it was just a really good debut, you know, um, fairy fairy tale stuff. Uh, afterwards, right on the field, walking off the field, I was mobbed by the players. Yeah, not the Middlesbrough players. All the scruffy Greek kids oh, wow. that I'd played with for, for a couple of years, you know, four, five, ten years old, twelve years old, all the way up to fifteen year old, they jumped they, all over me because I was now 
a, a player in, in a Middlesbrough first team shirt. Unbelievable. Yeah. Nottingham Forest come in for you. Of course, yeah. old Big Ed was running, Brian Clough. Did you meet? Did you get to meet the, the great Brian Clough? Oh, mate, I'll t- tell you a really interesting story. You know, Brian Clough was from Middlesbrough. Why was he? And he religiously trained afterwards, like me. And a lot of the, the ground staff at Middlesbrough had always said, hey, you're just like Brian Clough. You're different, you know. Uh, and, and he would do the same thing. So I, I, was, I always knew that Cluffy would come, come for me. Mm. And he did. He did. Uh, unfortunately, he phoned me from Malaga or somewhere in Spain um, and said he wanted to sign me on the same day that Bob Paisley phoned me from Liverpool. So ten teams came in for me, Tottenham and all, and, and uh, Middlesbrough had said, well, yeah. Mm. And uh, they were talking about £750,000, which would make me the most expensive player in British football Jeez, history. That's two, two, and, two and a half years after Nobby's Beach oh, and the skateboard and the surfboard. Uh, so... Um, um, basically, something worked in the car park. If there's any yeah. kids listening, yeah, uh, or any sportsman listening. listening. So when Clough comes in for it, but the moment you hear Bob, pa- the moment yeah. you hear Liverpool, is it only ever going to be Liverpool? Uh, n- not necessarily. At, at the time, um, Forest uh, and, and Liverpool were first and second in the league, uh, yep. and I'd always sort of looked very, very highly at Brian Clough. But I, I said he, he, he was in Malaga and he'd probably have a, had a few beers under his belt when he did phone me. Uh, if, you, if you know Clough, he'd, he'd had a dozen beers under his belt. Uh, and uh, um, I, I loved the concept of it, but, but when Bob Paisley phoned, I had a dilemma, so I phoned my dad, right? And dad probably had a few beers under his belt, a lot of beers back, back in those days. But uh, So I phoned dad and uh, again, um, I said, Dad, Here's the problem. There's a lot of clubs want to sign me, but Liverpool, both managers have phoned me. What would you do? And he said immediately, he said, he said, well, Brian Clough's a man. He said, and Liverpool's an institution. Mm. And he said, I'd sign for Liverpool. Mm. And that was it. When you turn up at middle, uh, at Liverpool, what, what is the difference? I mean, the class, you, you are in a golden period. Difference training-wise, school-wise, the players, how different was it? From Middlesbrough, you know, back then it was pretty pretty much the same, um, but clearly with better players, you know, it's faster and more accurate, um, and there was a different culture. And the backbone of the team was kind of predecided by Shankly. They're all Scots, and the Scot the Scots are particularly hard men, tough, and they they're good captains. Yeah. So if you've got Alan Hansen, who's a skipper. At the back, you've got Graham Souness in the middle, mm. and you've got Kenny Dalglish. You've got three captains, mm. three hard men, three consummate pro- professionals. So every morning in training, it was Scots versus the rest of the world. You're right. Right? And we would play at the six aside, and we'd play and play and play until the Scots win. <laughs> and if we won, he'd say, no, 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 another 10 minutes. The Scots had to win. That, <laughs> right. that was Bill Shankly. Mm. And, and that was the little six side game. So, so it was it was driven by by something more than I'd seen before. Um, for you, when you you, you get you know, a, a British record until the day after, but um, were you accepted straight away, Jono, or did you have to? Was there a little bit of disc? Did they did they make you work for acceptance? M- mate, I, I don't think I was ever accepted. Right. Uh, you know, I'm just different. I'm, I'm a different different person. Um, I, I couldn't be uh, uh, as, as hard as I wanted to. Uh, uh, I was a photographer. So, so you know, when the training was over, I had a digital... Uh, it wasn't digital. I had a dark room, yeah. uh, analogue dark room. And I, and I would then... I would go around to the players' houses and I, I'd take pictures of the kids and, and the wives, the family pictures of the players. And I'd come back and develop them. That, they'd do what footballers do, you know, uh, loved horses, the horses and gambling. Yeah, yes. You know, a few pints. Yep. You know, I didn't do that stuff. I, I was yep. just different, you know. And, life. And as I said, Bruce was different too, whatever. But Bruce, who, Bruce who, was nuts. Who helped you the most settle in at Liverpool? Uh, Kenny Dalglish. Um, what sort of man was Kenny Dalglish? Diamond of a man. Um and uh, I, I actually sat next to him in the dressing room and he said, where are you going to live? And uh, I said, I don't know. And he said, well, come with me. I'll show you where I live. 
which was Southport. Um, and uh, it's probably probably a, a big mistake I made. Uh, uh, you know the politics of the dressing room? Mm-hmm. So so he said, oh, here's where I live, which is right next to uh, Royal Birkdale, where they, where they play the British Open and stuff, as well. As well. So um, I... Um, I said no, no. I I I I went yesterday over the Wirral. I said no, I like that side better. So I lived over there. But every day, the clever clogs, right? Uh, Alan Hansen, Kenny, uh, the clever clogs. They'd all travel in the same car, you see, and they were the in crowd. You're right. The people on the Wirral were the out crowd. Me, Bruce, Johnny Walk, uh, a little guy called uh, Walshy. Uh, and uh, it's just funny, but but in every dressing room there's a clique. Of course there is, yeah. There's, there's the insiders yes. and I was always an outsider. Yeah, right. Uh, and it didn't bother me because uh. I didn't want to be an insider. Mm. Um, but in terms of effort and energy and commitment on the field, mm. that that spoke my vo- volumes. And like I said to you, when, um, when people say I'm, I was the fittest uh, guy in British football, uh, that was my teammate saying that. So I know it's true. Uh, yeah. I only say it because th- they said it. Uh, and I think that remember when Suarez came and we nearly won the league, mm-hmm. we came yep. second, remember yep. that year? Yes. And Suarez would hound people down to the uh, the touchline mm. and he's a star, you know, international centre forward. It worked. Yeah, mm. worked, worked, worked. And that year Suarez got 3 or 4% out of the other players, not just himself, because they said, well, if he's doing it, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Yeah, and I think that's what what I brought to the team back then, and it was infectious, you know, and that's why they respected me. Those those first seasons at Liverpool, mate, you win plenty of silverware. Um, Were the team – was the team good at celebrating? Were they a very social team? Mate, we had had a saying, win or lose, hit the booze – You've probably heard it before, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a story. Maybe I shouldn't, but go on. Okay. <laughs> so, so when, when I first signed, we, we were playing away at Chelsea, uh, Stamford Bridge, before the Russian owners. So they were yep. proper London club, not yep. me, not me. Yes, yep. Um, Beatles, you know, swing and sixties, Kings Road. So um, Ronnie Moran and Roy Evans, who were the, the backroom staff. Afterwards, I think we won 3 0 or something. So I'm sitting on the bus saying, Oh, wow, I've never seen this level of professionalism. So they brought all the kit out and all of that stuff. So then there's two or three boxes, and I wonder what the boxes are, you know, cardboard boxes. And I'm thinking, Oh, it must be dirty kit or new kit, new kit. Yeah, da, da. So anyway, back to what I was doing, right? Then they proceed to put beer on everyone's table. It's full of beer. So we've now got a three and a half hour trip to. Um, to uh, Liverpool, and there's all this beer. So they're all playing cards. I, I, I was always one for reading magazines and photography stuff. Uh, I'd always do that at the front of the bus. But now I'm saying, oh, this is good, you know, yep. a, a beer. <laughs> so as soon as the beer's finished, there's another beer. So I'm now on six or seven beers. I, I'm just new. I didn't even play. Yeah. And everyone's, oh, this is great. And I thought, <laughs> you know, and, and I said, well, what's this all about? They said, well, it's bonding. It's the culture of the team. It, 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 it's bonding. So, so it was kind of win or lose, hit hit the booze. But yeah. it, it was pretty magic. That they were all complete gentlemen, mm. complete gentlemen in the day. And again, goes back to professionalism and that Scottish backbone. Yep. I, I'm a big believer in that. So yep. anyway, here's the bit that I shouldn't tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Yeah, good. So anyway, so at Essen Park, Middlesbrough, the team bus when you played in London, bus would go back to uh, Essen Park, and then you'd get in your car and you go home. Well, this bus, because you asked me a question, we go straight to the straight to Liverpool, straight to the nightclub. You gotcha. Uh, and yep. you'd, you'd go straight into the bar, the back, the, the back door, <laughs> right? So you just had six or seven, you know, uh, pints, and uh, and I was like, wow. And all the boys would have a couple of beers, right? And it was a team bonding thing, and and bask in the glory of the fact that we would just won three yep. three nil away, uh, and and taken three points from London yet again. Mm. You know, which which yeah. was a re- religious habit, and then everybody go home happy. Yeah, right. But uh, we, that, they knew how to party, and, you, and that's the Scottish thing as well, and the Irish course, thing. Of course it, it is very, very strong. We we played a trial game once at Toowoomba, 
and we used to do the same thing. Like, I mean, we, like yeah, Newcastle's very much got that strong Scottish and Irish, and the culture of rugby league and all the Newcastle and Icebergs. Whenever we played a game, we drank all the way home. The problem was we played a game in Toowoomba once, and we got the bus home 14 hours. I got off. Oh, no. I remember getting off at Fanny's nightclub, and I tried to walk in. And he said, "Matty, how much you had a drink?" And I said, "14 hours worth." <laughs> Uh, 84 European Cup final, we just beat Roma. Yeah. In the in the Roman Coliseum, is it true the team walked onto the field singing one of your songs? Well, well, even better than that. Um, <clears throat> even better than that, uh, because we uh, a little bit like Liverpool versus uh, Tottenham in the last uh, Champions League final. We'd finished the season. Yep. But we had two or three weeks to wait. Oh, you're yeah, right. Before. The, the final against Rome, and back to what you said, win or lose, hit the booze, we went to Israel, right, on holiday. Well, no, sorry, training camp. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. Which, which turned into a major holiday uh, and uh, bonding sessions, mean, meaning alcohol, and, and forgive us, but it, this is what you did back then. What, yeah. no, nobody had... Nobody had had that break before. So, so, again, the music that we were playing, the stuff we were doing, and, you know, with each six aside games on the beach in Israel. It was all bonding stuff, yeah. right? But we were, uh, at the same time, um, Roma were incredibly professional, yep. doing high-altitude training, eating their pasta and their salads every day, right, and getting to bed early. So we're carrying on like a bunch of pork chops, you know, like a... I was going to say like a rugby league team at the end of the season <laughs> in King's Cross. The only yeah. thing we didn't do is show, show our bum to the public. <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness. There's some pretty big bums there as well. Um, now, um, the, the point was they were doing all this professional stuff and we were playing, as you said, at the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. well, it wasn't Coliseum. Yeah. At the Stadio Olimpico Olympia. in Rome. Yep. It was their ho home ground. They were four to one to win. Right. And the, the journalist had caught on to what we were doing. We, 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 uh, somebody said the wrong thing at the wrong time in, 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 in Israel at the bar. Yep. And the boys started fighting. So there was an internal brawl, bloody nose. So controversies, you aren't taken serious, all this. Yep. All, all, all the above. So we're four to one against. So anyway, um, on the team bus uh, going to the ground, um, one of, one of the things we really loved was Chris Rea, and it was song, a song called I Don't Know What It Is, but, but I Love It. Yep. And it talks about this feeling that you get inside and you can't put a name on it, but you love. And it's probably about Chris being in love, but mm. I think this was about us being in love with each other as blokes, yeah. right, yeah. back then, thinking that we could overcome the odds here. Um, so it wasn't on the field. In the dressing room... Um, Liverpool dressing room, there was a long, thin concrete tunnel, really long to get to the, to the field. And we had to go past their dressing room. So we're all going to stand up. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, so we're all in the dressing room. You, yeah. You've done this. You know when you're in a dressing room, right, and you've got your boots on, the studs, yep. the steel studs back then. Yep. Not the, They're making the noise. Not the yep. rubber ones they yep. have now. Yep. Steel studs. So I'm like this, you know. And it's making a hell of a noise because the tunnel's only this big, right? It's reverberating. So, um, so then Davy Hod Hodson, one of the other guys behind me, we're meet marching in time. So then Ronnie Whelan, you know, the, whoever, whoever else is there, like this. And then it, it was a beat. So I said, you know, uh, the words that Chris Rea song, uh, uh, you know, no. goes on. But yeah, uh, but I don't know what it is, but I love it. So we're going. I don't know what it is, but I want it to stay. I don't know what it is, but I love it. All of us like screaming and shouting. Now we're marching like an army. I don't know what it is, but I love it. And 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 the Italians are going, oh, my. God. <laughs> the barbarians yeah, are the coming. Barbarians. <laughs> the barbarians. The, the, the English hooligans meet barbarians. Oh, God. And we're screaming this at the, before we've even got to the field. So that, they'd never seen anything like it anyway. The, the, it, uh, it must have made a, a, a difference because we beat them. Um, okay, another song. But that was, that was team bonding. You yeah, know? That's, uh, of course. Like, like, like yeah. I said, that, that's what it was. And you'd never do it again. You're a songwriter as well, of course. You wrote the, the famous Anfield rap. Um, yeah. Okay, lyric. I like you. 
he, to give people an idea, it was a rap. And this, this were, the, we, these were your lyrics, Jono, which you sang. You said, well, I came to England looking for fame. So come on, Kenny, man, give us a game. Because I sat on the bench playing Jews with the Blues. I'm very, big, I'm very big down under, but my wife disagrees. How did it chart? Oh, the Anfield rap uh, got to number three. Did it? Uh, yeah, it got to number three. Number one was... Um, Madonna, and the Anfield rap, yeah, got, got yeah, like a virgin. <laughs> uh, so in the British charts, it was number three, but it, but it was different. Um, and basically, uh, it was a rap with all the accents. So, so th th that was my bit, which is uh, yeah. So I, 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 again, the lads, they said, well, cup final songs are rubbish. You, you write one for us. So quickly with John Barnes, I sat down and, 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 and I wrote. You know, the fact that uh, you had two Scousers, John Aldridge and Steve McMahon. So it started off with uh, those two. All right, Aldo, sound as a pound. I'm custy, la, but there's nothing down. The rest of the lads ain't got it sussed. We'll have to learn them to talk like us. Walk on. And then I stole, so the, good. I stole the, re the Beatles riff. Dun, da, 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 dun, da, da, da. Well. And then I uh, and, uh, and stole the uh, uh, You'll Never Walk Alone yep. and put them together. So it was Beatles, it was uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers, right? And then uh, Bruce was like, uh, so it was all this. I'm this rapping the now, I'm rapping for fun. Yeah, that was and, it. Yeah, I'm rapping now, now man, I'm, I'm rapping for fun. <laughs> I'm the goalie, the number one. You can take the miss, you can take the mick, don't call me a clown. Any more lip man, you're going down. Mate, Liverpool is a club, right? like so much prestige, so much success, John Owen history, but there's been some... Awful tragedy. Uh, 1985, European Cup final versus Juventus. The Hazel Stadium in Brussels. Um, you, you guys were in the dressing rooms preparing. Well, meanwhile, out, outside in the stadium, 39 people are, are crushed to death. Many hundreds injured. Did you guys have any idea what was taking place out there? Uh, well, two very different uh, uh, tragedies, uh, different times. Um, uh, to uh, the Heisel disaster, um, you know when you're, you're about to play rugby uh, and then sometimes you'll go to the field the day before if you're in a different city, different yep, country, yep. And, and you'll have a look and... Get your bearings. You, and get your bearings. What kind of studs do I need here? Yep. What, what's going on? Well, we, we did that in, um, in, in, um, in the Heisel Stadium. And there was a couple of, I'm going to call them scallywags, uh, but there was a couple of guys that were friends of the players that, scallywags are a bit harsh, they're, they're actually uh, good guys, mm. uh, uh, <laughs> good, good guys but friends, very streetwise friends. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we're walking around the stadium talking about our studs and the boots and the line markings and, you know, the size of the field because every, every field's different. Yep. And you've got you know, you you to feel that, as you said. Um, every soccer field, there's no standardised field, which is kind of weird. So this one, I'd, I'd never been to, we'd never been to. So the guys that know who are these hardcore supporters, there's going to be trouble tonight. And, and we've all said, well, why? He said, see that fence? See, that fence is coming down. You know, and it was a chicken wire fence. He said that the, the, the Liverpool supporters are going to be there, right? And the Italians is going to be there. So this is in between Italy and England in Belgium. Yep. And they called it 100%, 100%. So even before the game started, this chicken wire fence came it's down. Dragged down. Y y yeah, yeah. And, and there was a, a stampede, which is what, what killed the majority of the, the Italian fans uh, back here. So it was – they were crushed because there was a stampede – uh, from here, pushing these people, and there was a big brick wall that nobody could get over. So the deaths, the deaths occ occurred here. So it was kind of right above us, so we could hear it, but we couldn't see it. And they're just saying, there's trouble, there's trouble. And then the gendarmes came down and uh, they said, look, there's 10 people of, uh, you know, uh, uh, dead out there. You know, you've got to stay here. 20 minutes later, 20 people dead, 30 people. And we're like, well, what? Oh, yeah. And then we're thinking, we, we, we can't possibly play. And... Um, and then after, you know, what seemed forever, and um, we're all dressed in our kit. 
ready to play. Me and Bruce went, went up the tunnel and had a little look and it was just horrific scenes, you know, and people were now fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat <sighs> with the iron um, things from chicken wire fence. Uh, and we were like very, very quickly pushed back downstairs. And um, basically then the gendarmes came down and said, here's the problem. He said, we've got a stadium full of people right, who are now starting to fight, who want to see a soccer game. The only thing that's going to stop this, we have to the play. Game. Yeah. So then in, in that context, we went out and had to play. Was there – did the game mean anything? It know? was surreal and it was uh, very, very difficult to uh, muster, you know, any, any sort of, uh, sort of uh, normal situation and, uh, and, and play. It was quite sur surreal. Season eighty six, John, for you personally, is is a beauty. You win the uh, you win the double. You, you win the league, and you win the FA Cup. Um, FA Cups back in those days, it's a real shame, isn't it? like where it's been pushed down as far as prestige. I remember like. In Australia, was such a huge event right yeah. across the world. You it get was. up in the middle of the night; it was a must. You had to see it. It was bigger than Super Bowl, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It, it was. And but to be Liverpool versus Everton. Yeah. Does it get any bigger on Merseyside? No, no, it can't. It can't. It can't. And, uh, you know, the week before, funnily enough, we'd won the league at Chelsea and Everton came second. So all season, it's, it's, it's like last year it was Man City and Liverpool. But you imagine the same city, you're first and second. Now, the week later, you're in the FA Cup final. So you're either going to win the double and be one of three teams last century, only one of three, mm. to win the double, or are you going to share it with Everton? So you, you couldn't poke your head out of the door without somebody just, you know, loving you to death or someone hating you to death. I was going to play Wembley in 95. I remember walking onto Wembley for the first time when we played Great Britain in the World Cup. And the whole crowd was singing a land of hope and glory. And I yeah. thought of you in 86. I remember you saying about there was the story. Remember they used to call it the Wembley Wobbles where it takes it out of your legs, yeah. the big pitch. Yeah. Tell me about that game in 86, John. Your first half was difficult. Yeah. Well, well, mate, again, if, if, if you read the book, I've never read the book, by the way. You haven't? So, so you just reminded mate, me. You should have a read. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will. I will when I get home. Uh, <laughs> Number one, and, and I do remember saying in the book, you, you can remember very little from it, and I still can't. I've never seen the game. Mm. So I've never read the book, and I've never seen the game. Mm. And you just asked me a question. So, so my, my memory is, is all... It, 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 it's about the lightning bolt. And, yeah. uh, Talk the, about the goal. Well... Because um, what's amazing, you know, just your old high school, to give people an idea, mm. Burigal, you know, Burigal Taralba, that it's a real knock, you know, Great knockabout area up in Newcastle and Lake Macquarie there. And, you know, a lot of scallywags in that high school there. And I remember walking into that high school in the mid-90s and there was this huge big photo in the, you know, in the in the office building and it was you scoring the goal against Everton in the FA Cup final. And I thought, I thought, what a thing for kids to walk in and see every day. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. goal, did you remember the, the, the lead up to the goal and how it took place? Well, well I still can't believe it. See, see here's the thing. Because cause I was a knockabout bloke, uh, and again, we've been through the story, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like a fairy story, and uh, again, it, it was a dream. Mate, you, you missed a little important part of the story. I'm yeah. happy to, yep. I'm yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll do, link yeah, it no, together. Good but, as gold. But, but I was in hospital, a, a little bit like your brother. I was yep. in hospital with something called osteomyelitis, yep. which had been originally diagnosed as polio. And my mum had signed the amputation order to take the leg off in Royal Newcastle Hospital as a six-year-old. Yeah, so, so it's during that period, this was 1966, black and white television, where the World Cup was on in England, when England won the World Cup. Yep. And who were the stars of the show? The famous Charlton brothers. Bobby in midfield and his brother Jack. So it was that um, show... That, 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 that I was watching when, when after mum had, had done this. There was a famous doctor, uh, American doctor, Dr. Glass, who was touring, who said this might not be polio, it might be osteomyelitis, and if you let me operate, I'll save the leg. So, so years before even you know, going to Middlesbrough, I was living on borrowed time. So, so that, that brings it back. So when, when 
I was having not not a great game because I wasn't seeing much of the ball. Um, but then it popped up in front of me, in front of the goal. So, and the goalkeeper was slightly off his line. And uh, I think Jan Mulby crossed the ball and Dalgleish tried to backheel it. He missed it, went through his legs. And, you know, when people say um, you're in an accident or something and time stops. Slows. Or, or an earthquake or something or, or a great sporting moments, the purple patch. I'm looking at this ball and I'm looking at the goal and it's almost like I'm going, hang on a sec, there's the ball, there's the goal. I'm at Wembley. This is going to happen. And all i got to do is put that part of uh, my foot on that part of the ball, which I'd done in the Middlesbrough car park hundreds of thousands of times. And I, uh, my brain says, it can't be that easy. And then another part of my brain said, well, you better hurry up and do it. So I've gone like that. And then the noise just came back. So it speeded up again. And I jumped in the air and I said, I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. And all, all Rushy and Douglas, all of those guys say, oh, all right, all right, you've scored, calm down. And I didn't mean I'd done it, I'd scored. I'd, I'd beaten the, the osteomyelitis. I'd beaten all my teachers. I'd beaten Jack Charlton's comments. And I'd, I'd actually done it. So when I talk about the lightning bolt, you know, that's what it was like for me. It was my whole life story finished. You, you've, you've done what you set out to do. And uh, my world changed. When that, when, and it was an easy goal. Yep. It was an easy goal, thank goodness. But it was that simple. Uh, and uh, if you tomorrow, mm -hmm. is it written what happens? Is there? Do you, do you believe in destiny? Because you, you talk about all those events, all those hundred to one shots, and Doug Leish missing the ball completely, yeah. and then yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, Maddie. You, you, you make your own destiny. You make your own luck. Uh, it's it's there's an energy force out there in, in mother nature you know and uh you know without being uh too spiritual or religious about it you know uh, uh there's a god uh and good is a word away uh, a letter away mm. from god you know and mm. devils are a word away from evil so there's good and bad positive and negative forces and and what you got to do is is tap into the positive ones and then it writes itself john i just um just days before the 1988 FA Cup final where you guys to play Wimbledon, you get news through that your, your sister has fallen ill in Morocco and that coming back to Australia, she's going to need round-the-clock care. Um, you make the decision there. It's time and you go, you go to Liverpool and say to them, I'm retiring, I'm going back to Australia. We'll, we'll get to a second about how difficult that must have been for you, but how did Liverpool take that? Well, I I told the the management specifically because I didn't want the media to to know about it. Um, and it, the 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 accident had happened, you know, two or three months before before the end of the season. And uh, Faye was in a coma in Morocco. Her husband had died a couple of weeks before in suspicious circumstances. So she'd gone to pick up his belongings. Now she was in Morocco had a dreadful accident where she was getting a shower and the uh, the flame blew out and uh, the gas made her unconscious. But as she fell, she hit her head on the side of the bath, completely knocked herself out. So she was lying for an hour, breathing in all the all the gas, which gave her massive, massive brain damage uh, and, and in a coma. So I, I had to fly to Morocco to bring her and her, her daughter, Jamila, um, bring her back to London. Um, and then mum and dad had to come from Australia. So Faye was in London in a coma for quite a while. And I was going up and down the motorway trying to play. Nobody knew about it, uh, even the players. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the Kenny knew about it and Peter Robertson, the chief executive, and other people. But, but we couldn't let the media know. Um, and, you know, for that period, three or four months, uh, I saw life differently. Uh, and, and, and I said, um, you know, that... That simple scoring of that simple goal, uh, my life changed. And this was hard to take, Faye. Um, the uh, hospital bills, uh, she wasn't insured, were horrendous. Uh, and, and mum and dad were now uh, living in London, which I was paying for everything. Uh, and it was a huge drain all up. Uh, and I, I started to see things in a different way. And mum had to give up her teaching job. And I knew they were going to have uh, help with Faye. And something in, inside of all of us said that Faye will get better. And I thought, well, if I, you know, 
retire or, or, or you know have, have have a year off, uh, I can come back to football. Uh, Faye never got better. Uh, I never came back to football. Uh, I ran out of money because because uh, the hospital bills, and I had to get a job. So that's when I. Uh, Met a guy called David Hill, and he gave me a job at Wide World of Sports. We all yeah. know the, the famous David Hill. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Faye's still not recovered. Uh, Mum's still looking after her on a daily basis up in Newcastle at uh, Fig Tree there on, on Lake Macquarie. Um, and, uh, yeah, I retired when I was 27, and no, nobody had ever walked away from the game, and everybody was like, hang on a sec, this, this guy's a good player. Nobody walks away from the game, so... The, 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 the papers basically broke the story um, that after the Wimbledon game I was, I was going to retire and they shouldn't have. Uh, they broke their, their promise uh, and as a result Dalgleish dropped me so rather than playing my last game ever at Wembley against Wimbledon, I got dropped uh, so I could never play again and I've never played again. So no, nobody's, uh, that story hasn't been really told I just told it, uh, and uh, it was very sad. And I look back now, uh, all that hard work, and uh, you know, uh, the the big regret is 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 Faye though, and uh, and the tragedy. So uh, you know, it's uh, it's a cruel life. I, I keep saying it. So you're back in Australia, John. I'll give you um, while on Liverpool, the fifteenth of April, nineteen eighty nine. The Hillsborough disaster, one of the greatest tragedies in world sporting history. It involves you, your uh, dear Liverpool and supporters and Nottingham Forest. Um, John, were you, were you alerted back in Australia to what was taking place back in Sheffield? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was on... I had a, a Liverpool surfboard uh, made by a good, that. A yeah. good uh, shaper. Mark. Uh, it was Mark Richards. It was... Um, uh, Burns, Mick Burns. Oh yeah, right. Um, and I had a Liverpool surfboard, and and I was out the back, one of the beaches, and uh, um, a, a guy was shouting at me from from the shore, and I thought it was a shark or something. I'm thinking, oh, what's he shouting at? Me? He's shouting at me. What's he saying though? No, you know, like I thought, oh, hang on a sec. So I paddled in. He told me what happened. He said, you don't know what's happened. He said, this is happening right now. You need to need to go. So I've gone home and. Uh, found out what it was and, and I just said, I've got to get there. I've, I've, got, I've got to go there. So I dropped everything and uh, got the next plane to Liverpool. You went back for the for a number of funerals and memorials. Yeah. When you arrived in Liverpool, in Liverpool uh, what state was the city in? Oh, you know, sure. It, 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 like Newcastle was in the earthquake. You know, but more more deaths and through the strangest of ways, you know, crushing uh, at a semi-final uh, against Nottingham Forest. You know, uh, I mean, 90-odd people lost their lives and, and many, many more injured and in hospitals with comas, right? And the comas were, were predominantly from the lack of oxygen, from the pushing, which is exactly the same uh, as what Faye had. Right from the lack of oxygen that was uh, pushed out by the gas. Lack of oxygen. So I'd spent many, many months with Faye in a coma, trying to bring her out of the coma by doing all sorts of, 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 of uh, therapy and all sorts of uh, audio therapy, you know, getting their kids, pinching their kids, making the kids squeal. Parents recognise the, the kids squealing, stuff like that, um, which which I done with Faye, and uh, so uh, th that's what uh, we were doing, and um, it was um, catastrophic for the city. You, you've uh, you had a great bond, and you said you had, you know, the uh, the cop fans loved you because you know you you're you're a hand dog, you worked hard, Re you know, you raised money in Australia. Of the families affected, and they said you flew back for the amazing gesture to fly back for the funerals. Um, rumor was that Liverpool were keen for you to come out of retirement and and, and reignite your career. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was still young enough, um, and and a, a couple of things around that. Um, Kenny was was in charge, and uh, it was really really great to see him. Um, and uh, I spent a couple of months there um, doing what I could. Uh, and uh, when it was time to come back home, uh, Kenny said, can you come to my office? I want to see you. And I said, 
yeah, sure. So I went and went to see him, and he said, "Look, uh, I'm sorry about you know you walking away like you had to, and what happened, and the the press leaking the story." He said, "Let's forgive and forget. You've come back." He said, "He said you had your tragedy, which is your sister. We've had ours." Uh, and he shook my hand. And he said, "By the way, uh, he said uh, I got something for you," and I said, "What?" And he opened his drawer and he pulled out a medal. He said, uh, "That was your league championship medal." He said, "You you forgot to take it." When you when you went, uh, then he said, um, he said, any time you want to come back here and be a player, he said, uh, uh, we're all ears and we'll sign you up. Um, Why not, Jono? Oh, you, you know, uh, I I had a job uh, back home and uh, back back to the fact that I'd I'd I'd, I'd achieved. Mm. Um, and you know, you know, the other thing is that. With that sacrifice of the brick wall and that intensity, you know, uh, of of lifestyle for so long, yeah. there was a big bold world out there that that I'd now understood the world of television, which which I was now in, and loving it, producing and directing, similar to what you're doing now. Yeah. You're telling stories of sportsmen. Well, that's what I I found the love of that at yeah. Bywater Sport. You know, and I'd go and do Wally Lewis or, uh, you know, Jeff Fennec or, you know, uh, Dawn Fraser. You know, you know all these uh, five-minute story every week. I thought, I thought, you know, mm. uh, without the pressure of uh, training and, and all of that stuff. So life to me had been that for so long. So, so I, I kind of loved it. Um, Faye was getting better, but not at the rate. She was out of a coma now, but still... Um, you know, if you like, uh, com compass mentis, you know, mm. uh, still uh, unrecognisable. Or you think she doesn't recognise you. Now and again, she'll go, when you say something, she'll go, hang on. So you think she's there, you know. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, and I was back home and uh, I was getting on to, you know, 30 years old. Mm. Um, and, you know, you know, there was a big wide world out there. And, yeah, and, and get that, John. It, yeah, it, yeah. Here's an interesting yeah. thing that, that people... Yeah. You know, I, I was later later on. I, I went over to Ireland and I lived with the kids. So when I was with Adidas, uh, I didn't like Germany at all. So I would commute from Dublin. So I had a few things on. I had the mini bar fridge thing. I had the the Adidas Predator, and the journalist asked me. He said, um, uh, "From from the, the the big paper there, um, you're doing a big story. Uh, the fact that I was living in Ireland." He said, "The thing that everybody wants to know is, he says, how can a footballer?" Right, become an inventor because at the time Adidas was mm. it was the largest selling boot of all time. I said, well, that's where you got it wrong. I said I was an inventor that became a footballer. Oh, it resonates with me that story. I, I mean, we talk about you know, your family, my family. My brother was the natural. Everything was easy for him. Where mm. I was, mm. he was the Mark, where I was the Steve. Where I had to work on everything, work double time, get out in the field, work hard. Mm. By the time I was 31, John, I remember walking into bookstores and picking up books on weird subjects and going, God, I'd love to do that mm. because mm. my brain had just had enough. Yeah. I was yeah. over it. I was yeah, ready yeah. for another. I needed to focus on something else. Yeah. Football was very good to you, but you're about to do an amazing contribution to football, which you just touched on. Um, the boot that you invent, go and become the most popular boot in sports history, change a number of sports. Yeah. Give me, where did the, the initial idea for the Predator boot come from? Back to the Middlesbrough car park. What did we talk about? You have to be a better player uh, at night than when you woke up in the morning. So... What part of foot on what part of ball to what effect? That thinking was back to the science and the math of uh, what is a ball's perfect object. So that whole thinking, um, I always had to think about what I was doing when I was doing it, left foot, right foot. Uh, so it g goes back to that. Um, then there was a number of things I've seen along the way, and I was interested. I, w I was always good at school with uh, y you know, m metal work, tech drawing, math science, I love that stuff. I'm a product guy, so you've got to understand, people say you're an inventor, well, yes, I've had patents, mm. I'm a product guy. So I love, love football boots, love footballs. So, so therefore, um, when I retired, um, and uh, David Hill offered me the job at Wide World of Sports, so I was living in Sydney, Avalon, knock on the door, two little kids with a ball under their arm. 
Mr. Johnston, we're the local soccer team. We come and coach us. And I said I'd never go back into, into soccer, but I couldn't resist these little kids. Anyway, they said, we're not very good. So I went down and they were right. They're not very good. <laughs> so, so You turned into Big Jack. Yeah, yeah exactly. I did. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't bully them, but I, yeah. I said, no, you're not very good. So I'm going to teach you now how to how to swerve the ball. So I was teaching them how to swerve the ball. Uh, and I said, it's like a table tennis bat, kids. You know, you get that top spin or that back spin. And the kids went, ah, oh, got it, got it. And then one of the kids said, um, uh, Mr. Johnston, um, he said, yes, I get it. He said, but it's starting to rain and our boots are made of leather, not rubber, and the ball's slipping. And I said, you're right. So anyway, it then thundered down and we had to abandon the, the, the session. So driving home, I said, those little kids are right. So I got home, I got a table tennis bat, I peeled it off, the, the rubber, I stuck it on my boot and I wrapped it up with elastic band, went in the backyard and I kicked the ball with a bit of side spin and it squealed like a pig. And I said, bingo. I said, the kids are right. So, 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 uh, so then I... Um, I went to a lawyer in Sydney, and this is before internet and any of that stuff. And I said, "Is there any patents on table, table tennis bats on your on your boots?" He said, "You know, a couple of weeks later, because they have to manually search them." Uh, he said, "No." So then I started the patent process, and I started to uh, design a bigger sweet spot and all the things. Uh, I told you I was a product guy, so I spent months on this, and then uh, I thought this works because I would then go and kick. A ball. I've tried all sorts of rubber and windsurf boots, thousands of different things because I'm fascinated. Mm. You know, what part of foot on what part of ball. Yeah. But you get a bit more rubber, like a table tennis. Yeah. You get whatever the language in your head of spin is. You know, you play soccer as well. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and it was three or four or five percent more, the original prototypes. So that, that's how it started. So you took it to Adidas. Initially, and they went not interested. Nike, Reebok, no one interested. No one then interested. You went all, all over the world, by the way, over a period of two or three or four years, at, no. at huge expense, by the way. And at, at the same time, the main event was doing well. Uh, TV show. Yeah, yep. Larry Hemder. Yep. Yeah, Larry was at Channel Ten, and I said he's a perfect host. Did you hear the, the, the news this morning about Larry Hemder? No, he passed away. Uh, how old do you reckon he would have been? You're taking them. <laughs> You're supposed to say 55 and I'll say lower. <laughs> Sorry. It's a You're bad terrible. joke, John. It's uh, a bad I, joke. I, I, Sorry to Larry Emder and his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bad <laughs> joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, good lad, good lad. Yes. Yeah. But, on the, but on the boot, you, you, you get a video camera, you get a handy cam, yeah. you get the prototype and you go to Germany and take it to the great Franz Beckenbauer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just because I knew that, that it worked and um, – you know, whatever the politics of all the brands were, I mean, I mean, this was causing me great, great pain that I've spent all this money and time and a lot of money. And everyone's saying, hang on, you've, you've got a TV show, a primetime TV show back, back in Australia, including Jenny, my wife at the time. Mm. You know, uh, what's going on? And I said, this works, this works. So the only thing I could do was get a German player. So I knocked on Bayern Munich store in the snow again, December. Um, you got to help me. Uh, he said, uh, you know, what's your name? It's Craig Johnston, Franz Beckenbauer. So he said, oh, he knows exactly who you are. He's a big Liverpool follower. Come back tomorrow with four pairs. That was the message. So I only had right foot size eight because that was the prototype boot, windsurf boots. I brought them back the next day. He had um, Karl, Karl Heinz Rubiniger, Paul Breitner um, and one other legend. So the four of them started kicking the ball backwards and forwards and going, Jawohl, uh, das ist gut. Uh, Jawohl, uh, making the right shapes. So I was just filming. I had no idea what they were saying to each other. And then I took that videotape back up to Nuremberg, knocked on the door again. And I said, oh, they said, oh, you're the guy from Australia. We've told you no. They said there's a big uh, board meeting going on. Adidas was going bankrupt. They couldn't pay their debts. They're trading as insolvent. So a French man called Bernard Tapie was buying them for a dollar. Must say. Yeah, that's him. That's him. That's it. Mm. He was buying it for a dollar from the Dazzler Daughters. So they, they were, as I said, trading as insolvent. So, uh, so they said, I said, you've got to stop the board meeting, you know, and the guy's, well, hang on, I'm the security guy. So he's phoned up and I spoke to the guy and they said, well, we've said no. I said, I have the Kaiser. I have the Kaiser. So they said, send him up. So you have the Kaiser? I said, he's on here. 
right? And they said, well, what's he saying? I said, I don't know. I don't speak German. So they put it in the, in the machine, right? And within 30 seconds, there's about, I don't know, 12 of them, they all stood up and they all started clapping. They all said, this is the future of our brand. And then he turned around uh, Tappy and uh, there was a guy from America. They said, uh, you can't leave this room without signing a deal. So I, I signed the deal because I owned a patent. I signed a licensing deal on the spot. So they never owned it. I owned you the patent. What, what were the terms of the contract you signed? Well, they, they were very good uh, on my side, uh, which was fine for the five or six or seven or eight years when it wasn't making any money. Developing. Yes. Yes, when, it but when, the, when Zidane, Beckham... Uh, yeah, when it started making a lot of money, then, then I was getting a lot of money. Mm. And new owners came in and didn't like it. So, once again, uh, you know, uh, it was the politics of the office and, and I had to go. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. this next invention of yours, I'm, I, I, I didn't like because over the years it's cost me quite a bit of money. So, I'm one of those, I'm one of those thieves um, that used to do the, the water and vodka trick. Now, you invented the butler minibar. Yeah. Whereas basically, it's one of those things, people, you take it, you, whatever you take out of the minibar, it registers straight down in the lobby computer. Yeah, yeah. You cost me a lot of money over the years. Where did the, where did the idea come from? Uh, <laughs> well, I used to room with Bruce Grobler. So, so basically, if I wasn't pinching the beer, he was, and we were blaming each other. So You're right. Say, say no more. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. How'd that, do, how'd that go for you? It was very good? Uh, it was good up to a, a point. Um, and, uh, it, again, it took a lot of money and a lot of resource and a lot of energy out of me. Uh, and, again, like Adidas, when you deal with these big companies, uh, it, it's easy once they you're inside for them to sort of engineer round your patent. That's what happened with Adidas. Uh, they engineered round my patent. And, and similarly with, with the, the other company, the butler, mm. they engineered round it. So live and learn. Uh, Maddie, you know yeah. that's that's part of life's process. Live and learn. Yeah. Um, Pricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, business uh, business people are all about business and money, and uh, you know that's the way the world works. It's ruthless. Yeah, it is. Let's talk about the circumstances, John. I would, would see you declare bankrupt after all this. Mm -hmm. What happened, mate? Oh, um, well. If, if you're a product guy and you, you're looking for perfection, uh, you, you, keep, you, know, you keep trying to design something that's perfect and uh, if you're not selling it at the same time, uh, cash flow out versus cash flow in, you end up with nothing. And uh, uh, I was dealing with uh, FIFA and the Premier League and the FA uh, on, a on a bunch of stuff and they would promise me if I did a certain thing that they would give me certain rights. And I kept doing the certain thing and they kept saying, oh, hang on, one more thing, one more thing. I kept spending money and time went on. So in the end, um, you know, at one stage I had three or four royalties coming in from the shoe, from the main event, you know, and, uh, and that's why I had to live off offshore, you know, because it was all royalty free. So it was all patents and ideas and in Ireland. Mm. Uh, that's why all the, uh, you know, the, the big bands, were going and Rod Stewart. Donald, you know, they yep. were all they were all living near you too. Yep. You know, Def Leppard. They're all on our street, by the way. <sighs> Noisy buggers. Anyway, <laughs> the th the thing is that uh, uh, everybody was uh, uh, living on royalties, and I had all of this. And then, as I said to you, I, I had this brainstorm about coaching in the Middlesbrough car park and how I could pass that on. But I needed FIFA and all of this endorsement. And these guys just, you know, they would come and go. These administrators, you know what I'm talking about. They're, yep. they're rife yep. in this country, by the way, yes. if you haven't noticed. Yep. Uh, so dealing with those people, I, I actually uh, lost a bunch of money. Uh, uh, but like the Predator and like my football, I was back on myself. Uh, and blindly, I, I guess, and I, I, I went bankrupt. And very, very embarrassing. And my dad would be ashamed of me, you know. Uh, that's the way I grew up. I could be ashamed of For you. For going bankrupt, I meant. Yeah. You know, the whole bankruptcy oh, no. thing, you know. And uh, How hard did that hit you? How, how, how hard does it hit your confidence, John? <laughs> well, it, it, it does, you know. Uh, it does. Uh, it's, you know, your self-esteem's uh, kind of intrinsically linked to what you have in the, the bank. And when you've got nothing, uh, you know. It's uh, it's uh, it's very tough, you know. Uh, you got to start again, um, 
and you've got to find all of that uh, grit and determination and uh, steely resolve to, to go forward, you know, and it's uh, Bill's character. Uh, so, you know, I was on, on the breadline for, for a long, long time, uh, but nobody knew. Uh, because, again, because my dad and the, the, the values they instill in you, you just keep going and, and you'll get a break because, because of the positive stuff that's out there. And uh, Where were you living, Jono? Wherever I could. Yeah, wherever I could for a period. Yeah. Because there were reports at the time, because, you know, here I mine, I'd say to people, what's Jono doing? They'd say, mate, no fixed address. Yeah. Is he homeless? Yeah, what's yeah, yeah, well, yeah, homeless. Yeah. Uh, Penniless, uh, plenty of ideas though, uh, and uh, still, still belief that uh, that start again, you know, like everyone else. Um, and uh, it's it, it's good for the soul, you know, and uh, yeah. Finally, you've mentioned your health a number of times. Can I ask you? It, um, how are you? Like, um, what's the diagnosis? Everything? Yeah, yeah. It was it was all through there, and it was headed for my eye and my brain. So that's how close it got to my, my eye, uh, and it's they had to cut me all down there. So it's four major operations, but the doctor said because I was doing cricket, soccer, whatever, surfing when I was young, he said that's when it it it, it happened. So he said there's there's three types: skin cancer, squamous cell, basal cell, melanoma. Uh, he said, and you've got all three, and it's in your nervous system. So I had 20 or 30 operations mm. uh, before that. So, But it kept coming up here, um, and they kept cutting me, closing it up. And six months later, cut it open. Mm. So mm. so um, he said, we have to hit it with a hammer. Uh, so I had the most dreadful year I've had with radiation right next to my brain stem and uh, enough drugs to kill a horse. Couldn't eat, couldn't drink, as skinny as a rake, stuck in a house. And all I could do was kind of say what I've just said to you about my blessed, blessed series of lives mm. and how all those hard-earned lessons, I need to pass them on before I pop off, if I pop off. And, uh, We're all going there eventually. Well, we are. We are. So, so get it done. Get it mm. done. And, uh, and uh, pass it on to the kids um, um, so that it's not wasted. What, what was the point of the struggle mm. if you can't pass it on? And right. That's that's what legacy is. So, very quickly, I I I don't like telling the story. I t told you it gets emotional. You're, you're different. You're you're a legend, uh, right. and uh, we all love you dearly. Uh, that, that's why I'm here. Um, what I want to call the documentary, which I'm thinking of putting together myself and filming a lot of it, mm. which again will be different to what other people have done. Yep. It's called Triumph, Tragedy, Legacy. Uh, all the things you touched on, uh, Craig Johnston's story. So, what do you think? I spoke to a mate of mine yesterday who's a um, TV producer and he's just done the life of Michael Hutchins. And I said, mate, I'm interviewing Craig Johnston. I'll get it to you. It's the story. Wow. It's wow. the story. Yours. Okay. Uh, okay. Jono, I just... Yeah. Jono, it is so good to see you again. Thanks, and, man. mate, thank you for sharing your story. And as I said before, yeah. mate, thank you for everything you've done. Uh -huh. you've, you've, you've blazed the path, mate. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. Newcastle boys rule. <laughs> Give my best Arnie Lorna. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Good, Good on you, you Jono. Good on you, mate. Good on you. Well done, well done. Good on you, brother. This has been a Fox Sports production.